Well, good evening. It is so great to have you here tonight. Thank you so much for being here and uh, being with part of our online connection group tonight. And it's so great to have you here. And uh, hey, Dennis and Johnny, great to have you here. Brenda, good to see you. Verla, always good to have you here. Maureen and Misa, great to have you here. Bob and Sharon and Dennis and Diana, great to have you here. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, uh, I saw in Rapid City that you had a Really nice day today, up in the 60s, and uh, got rid of probably most of your snow. A couple of the webcams I looked at, couldn't see any snow, but uh, a beautiful day here in uh, southwest Missouri. It started off kind of cool and uh, had a wind kind of howling a little bit today, but we, uh, uh, towards evening, the sun kind of came out. It was still a little chilly, but it's going to get warmer this week, and, and, uh, my apple trees are blooming, and we have some dogwoods back behind the house here that are just starting to bloom a little bit, and so it looks like spring is well on its way here, and uh, so it's it's uh, it's great to see the changing of the seasons, and uh, the good news is it doesn't matter what season it is, God is with us, and uh, so we are appreciative of his presence, so thank you so much for being here. If you have prayer requests, if you please put them in the chat. And we're going to be praying here uh, just a moment. And uh, if you have your prayer sheet from Crossroads, we're going to be walking our way through that and uh, and just be praying for the requests that people have put on the prayer cards and, uh, and just uh, be walking our way through that. Also, uh, just a couple passages that we're going to be looking at from John chapter 20. So if you have your Bibles with you, if you'd like to look at John chapter 20, a couple passages we're going to use there and other passages as well. Uh, but we'll walk through a couple of those together. And uh, tonight as we, uh, we're going to continue uh, before Easter, we were doing a little series where we were, uh, 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 we were doing a little series where we were talking about um, the people who were at the cross. And if you don't mind, I would like to continue that tonight and kind of end up with a, uh, one more person who was at the cross, and so we're going to be looking at that tonight, and so uh, we want to be remembering that. And uh, uh, Denise, I think, has mistyped there. Uh, Dennis and Johnny's neighbor has cancer, and so we want to be praying for this neighbor that has cancer um, and just be praying for that. Uh, also, if we want to continue to pray for my friend Carrie and her husband Mark. Uh, we've talked about it before, but Carrie has stage four cancer. And then Denise's uncle Dale, if we could continue to remember him as well. And uh, and so let's just uh, continue to pray for that and, and just ask God to be working in that. Well, if you have your prayer sheets and if you'd like to follow along, if not, let's just uh, agree together in prayer and, and let's just be praying. God, thank you. Uh, it was we just this past weekend came through Easter. Our, our hearts were just gladdened and we were reminded of just the power of the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins and then came back to life. And I know we celebrated it this last weekend, but quite frankly, <laughs> this is something we could celebrate every day. And I hope that we do the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and then came back to life. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that we can have a relationship with you. And we thank you that that you walk with us every day. You're an ever-present help in the time of trouble. You're that friend that sticks closer than a brother. And God, we just worship you and just thank you for all that you have done for us. And, and God, your dying on the cross was more than enough, but then you continue to bless us and continue to walk with us. And you are so good to us. And so God, we're just grateful, and we just thank you for that. And God, tonight, as we just pray, we're just uh, praying for crossroads. And uh, God, I just would pray for unity in the church and just pray that there would be no drama. And and God, I pray that you'll just be walking with Pastor Sonny and Missy and, and the board as, uh, as they lead this congregation. And thank you, God, for the candle being lit for people who have been coming to you. And God, we're just so grateful for that. And we just pr to praise you. And uh, God, we know the youth pastor is coming very soon. And and I pray that you'll just be in that transition. And and, and God, just uh, be walking with them, I pray. And God, so we just pray peace over Crossroads. 
And I pray that you'll just continue to move hearts. Rapid City needs Jesus. And I pray that you will help Crossroads to do that and help them to just continue to focus on that, that and uh, that Rapid City needs Jesus and, and any other issue is a minor issue. The major issue is that Rapid City needs Jesus. So God, we just pray that you will be there tonight and the adult groups that are happening and the kids club that is going on, be with Jackie and Scott and Holly as they minister to the kids. And then those who are ministering to the youth tonight, God, I pray that you'll just be with them. And I, I just pray throughout everything that is going on, that your presence will just be felt and that you'll just be there in a powerful, powerful way. And God, we pray tonight that you will be in our study as we take a look at another person who was at the cross and we look at their story. I pray that you will just be walking with us and help us to just not only learn something, but God, help us to connect with you. And so God, we just pray that you will just be uh, with us tonight. And God, we're just reminded uh, Sally is asking us to pray for her husband, Felix. And uh, God, we don't know what's going on, but she asks for salvation and asks for her marriage and and deliverance from alcohol and drugs and gambling. And she's saying, Lord, restore my marriage. And, and God, we don't know all what's going on here, but God, we pray that you will just be touching Felix tonight and bring people, bring situations into his life. And God, we just, we just ask that you will just be just helping Felix tonight and just convict him, God. And God, we would echo that. I know all of us on here tonight have loved ones who uh, need you. And so we would just echo this prayer to say, God, would you just bring people or situations or whatever into their lives? And God, just reach them, we pray. And, 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 and God, we know that when we pray for someone to be saved, we're praying in your will. And so, God, we ask that you will just be working and, and just bringing, may your Holy Spirit just be bringing those people to the spot where they will accept you as their personal Savior. And Marjorie is asking for her friend with the health issues. And God, I just pray that you will be with John. And God, I don't know what John's spiritual condition is, but God, just be with him as he deals with these health issues. God, we do pray for Don and Sarah tonight. And, and God, I pray that you just be keeping your hand on them and God, we don't know what the timeline is so that uh, Sarah's going to be going home, but God, we pray that you will just be walking in this situation and keep your hand on them. And I pray for Don, God, that you will just be giving him comfort and, and just be with him in a, in a powerful way. Missy is asking us to pray for her brother Travis and wife Beth uh, and the family. They're dealing with some health issues. And, and with Beth and their sons and Braxton and Cole. And so, God, we just pray that you'll be. We're not sure what all is going on, but we pray for healing and wisdom and comfort. And, and God, just be in that. And Dean and Patty ask us to continue to pray for Marionette and Denise and Lynette. And God, you know what is going on there. And, and, and God, they're just names to us on a paper, but God, they are people. And we pray that you'll just be working in their lives and, and just be walking with them. And God, we do pray for Dennis and Johnny's neighbor. And God, you know this cancer that uh, he has. And God, just be just be with it in a powerful way. And, and I pray that you'll be working there. And God, again, we just want to pray for Carrie and Mark. And God, I pray that you'll just be walking with them through this time in their lives. And, and may they just sense your presence. And may you just be that God of all comfort. And we pray for Denise's Uncle Dale again, God, and pray that you'll just be walking with him and, and God just talking to him as well. As God, we just pray that you will just help him to, to make sure that he has done business with you. So God, thank you for the way that you are working and thank you for the way that you answer prayer. And, and God, we don't pray tonight just because it's the kind of the religious thing to do. We pray because we believe you answer prayer. And we've got evidence of it. And so, God, we just pray that you will just be working in all these requests. And again, God, we just pray that you will be with us tonight in our study. And may we just sense your presence across the miles. And as we're looking at computers and TV screens and, 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 and laptops and tablets or whatever we're looking at, God, may we just sense your presence through all those devices. And may you speak to us tonight. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it is so great to have you here, and thank you so much. And, Cherry, thank you for jumping in with us. It's great to have you here, and uh, 
We're so happy that you are here. As, as I said, we're going to be just a couple passages we're going to be looking at in John chapter 20. Uh, and there won't be a lot of uh, scripture tonight that we're going to be reading together. Uh, but uh, those be those couple passages. And one of them I, I really want you to have in your laps there so you could be looking at it with me. Uh, but I, I just hope you had a great Easter. And, and I hope you had a, just a wonderful time of celebrating our risen Lord and and Denise and I were privileged, uh, along with Dennis and Johnny and Brenda, to be going to a little church over in the town next to us called Wheatland. And we were privileged to be there. And, and it's such a privilege to, I was able to, uh, just privileged to lead and worship and then to sing in, in the service. And, and it was just a great service. And we had some new people there. And, and we're just praying that that God just spoke to their hearts. And, and so... Uh, it was just such a great celebration. And I know at the Crossroads, you had a great celebration. And Pastor Sonny did such a, a an excellent job on Sunday. And so he is risen. He is risen indeed. And we're so thankful for that. Well, there is an old, old song. Um, you know this song. Uh, the old song, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the... You know that song, right? The song has been around a long, long time, um, and and I remember when I was growing up. Even though I'm I'm not that old, I remember growing up hearing this song in the garden. Uh, I mean, Elvis recorded this song, uh, for goodness sakes. Uh, it's it's interesting now, though. About the only time I hear this song in the garden um, is I hear it at funerals, uh, usually for people who are older people. Uh, well, occasionally someone that's younger. Uh, also, uh, when when I was uh, doing services in uh, retirement center, we would sing this song often. Uh, it, it's one of those songs that that I have uh, done in in like nursing homes, and it's one of those songs that that there will be people in the nursing home service who will be sitting in their wheelchairs asleep, and you start singing in the garden, they will wake up and sing with you, and. Uh, it's an old, old song. I love this song. But what I love about this song is that this song is really telling the Easter story. The, the song In the Garden was written by a man named Austin Miles. He was a pharmacist originally and then turned into a hymn writer and, and ended up being a church music director, in fact. Uh, he was also an amateur photographer. And one day, way back in 1912, he was in his dark room waiting for some film to develop and while in the dark room, he had this profound spiritual experience where he saw this vision of Mary Magdalene visiting the empty tomb. And, and in this vision, he saw her leave the tomb, walk into the garden where she met the master and heard the master speak her name. And, and when Miles kind of came to himself, his nerves were vibrating, his, his muscles were tense, and the words of this song were filling his heart and mind, and he quickly wrote out the lyrics to In the Garden. Uh, later that evening, he composed the musical score to go with the lyrics. Uh, that song was published that a same year in, in 1912. They published it right away. And this song also then became the theme song for an evangelist named Billy Sunday, who was holding evangelist in crusades, this song kind of became a theme song. Uh, and then back in the well, the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, this was probably the top hymn in the United States. It was the, the top hymn in the country. And, and it's interesting, the song is actually from Mary Magdalene's point of view. I go to the garden alone while the dew is still. Uh, she... It's from Mary Magdalene's point of view. Now, let me just take a little side trip here, if I can. Um, if you look at the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they talk about Mary Magdalene going to the tomb with a group of other women. Now, John, in his Gospel, talks about her going alone. And, and, and it's fascinating because... You get critics of the Bible who just go berserk over something like this, you know, like, which is it? And I really get tired of people uh, who write blogs trying to make something out of the variations of some of the gospel accounts. I mean, it used to be that to, to write something meant you actually knew what you were talking about because what you wrote actually ended up in print on paper somewhere. 
And since there was limited space on paper, there was an editor that looked at it and you actually had to know something about or had at least studied the subject material in some sort of scholarly fashion. But nowadays, anybody with a computer can post a blog that can be read and copied and regurgitated by the masses. And it's, it's too bad that some of the stuff that is written is not written on paper because then it could at least be repurposed by somebody in an outhouse and, and at least it would be useful in that way. But, but let me just say to you, be careful about what you read on the internet um, because it's fascinating. Like for instance, Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about Mary Magdalene going to the tomb with a group of other women. John talks about her being alone. And, and so it's one of those things of like, well, which is it? Which is it? Well, well, let me just give you an illustration. I used this illustration once before in at, at Crossroads, and, and I want you to take a look. I hope you can see this. Uh, this is a picture. I, I hope you can see this picture. Uh, this is a picture of Harriet Thompson. Harriet Thompson was an incredible woman. She has since passed away. Uh, this is a picture from CNN from uh, from this 92-year-old Charlotte, North Carolina native um, became the oldest woman to complete a marathon when she crossed the finish line at the San Diego Marathon in June of 2017. Uh, she had a time of seven hours, 24 minutes, and 36 seconds, to be exact. And she completed this marathon at the age of 92 years and 65 days. And the headline with this picture was, 92-year-old becomes the oldest woman to complete a marathon. Now, th this is amazing. Wouldn't you agree? This is incredibly amazing that a 92-year-old woman um, did this. This is an incredible, incredible feat. B but I want you to look at something here, um, if you can. This is this is Harriet. If you look here over her shoulder, you see that young man that is there? Well, well that young man is Harriet's son, Brenny. And Brittany ran every step of this race with her, being a support, being an encourager, feeding her snacks, helping her in the race. And he played a very, very important role in this story. So what if we change the headline to 92-year-old woman runs and completes the marathon with her son? So we have two headlines. 92-year-old woman runs the marathon. Second headline is 92-year-old woman and her son runs a marathon. So I would ask you, which one of those headlines is correct? One or two? Which one of the headlines is correct? Well, the obvious answer here is that both of those headlines would be correct, right? But our blogger friends would protest. Now, wait a minute. Aren't those stories different? I mean, the, the one headline tells nothing about the sun, so isn't the story different? And, and, and the answer is absolutely not. It's it's the exact same story, and the, and the different headlines is describing the exact same event. You, you see what I'm talking about? But you know, but there would be people who say, "Well, you know, the one the one story says nothing about the sun, so the stories have to be different." And and no, they're not different stories. They're the exact same story with a different perspective. One is focusing on the 92-year-old woman who did this incredible event. The other one is mentioning in a little greater detail who else was there. So they're both the same story with different perspective and different levels of detail. Does that make sense? And we see this so, so many times in the gospel accounts. There's an account of a demon-possessed man uh, or demons-possessed men in the Gezerin tombs. Now, Matthew, in his account, talks about there being two men, but Mark and Luke only talk about one. Now, Mark and Luke don't say that there was only one demon-possessed man. They simply said that one of the two men met Jesus and spoke with him. So of the two men that were there, only one of them spoke, apparently. And so while Matthew gives the details of their two men, Mark and Luke focus on the one who was speaking. They focus on the one who spoke, and for whatever reason, they pass on the detail of the fact there were two of them there. You, you see this in the Easter story at the tomb. Matthew and Mark tell about an angel speaking to the woman. 
Luke gives a little more detail and says there are two angels of which one of them spoke. So Luke's just given us a little greater detail of the same story. John doesn't say anything about angels. John is more interested in Mary's response. The fact is they're all telling the same story, just with different levels of detail. Now, quite frankly, here's the deal. If all of the gospel accounts told the same story with the same detail, you know what the critics would be saying? The critics would be saying, well, there's collusion, and, and they're, they're, they're all got copying off of each other. And the story would be suspect. But the fact, actually, that the stories are different actually tells us a little bit about the reliability of the Bible in the fact that the, they all have a story from a perspective of a different eyewitness, and each eyewitness gives us a different level of detail. And, and it's the same thing tonight that we're going to be talking about Mary Magdalene, and, 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 and we see a little different level of detail. Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about Mary Magdalene going to the tomb with a group of other women. John says she was alone. So which was it? Well, if you look at the gospel narrative, it, it is it, it, it's what probably happened is that the women go together as soon as Mary Magdalene sees the stone is rolled away, she takes off running. In fact, I want you to listen to what she says to Peter and John after seeing the stone rolled away. And this is in John chapter 20. If you have it there in your Bibles, uh, we're going to be looking at it right here at verses 1 and 2, John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. And I'm reading from the NLT, uh, but it's going to be close to whatever you have there. Uh, but John chapter 20, verses 1 and 2 says this, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and the NLT renders this, and we don't know where they have put him. Did you catch that from the NLT? They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. We, we don't know who's we. We is the other women. So the women go, Mary Magdalene runs off, and so then later she goes back to the garden alone. I come to the garden alone. And she goes back to the garden grieving, thinking that, that her world has been turned upside down, that, that not only has she lost a dear friend, not only has hope died, but someone had done, has done this terrible, horrible act of grave robbery. And not only has she lost her friend, but now his body's gone. But then he speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. So what we're looking at tonight is, is the Easter story through the eyes of Mary Magdalene. And because she was definitely present in these events. Now, who was Mary Magdalene? And, and I, I, I'm fascinated by the story of Mary Magdalene, quite frankly. Uh, in fact, some of you who hung around Crossroads for a while, you will recall a few years ago, I actually wrote an Easter pageant uh, from Mary Magdalene's point of view. Uh, and so it's fascinating. Uh, Mary would have been one of the women who participated in Jesus's ministry. Um, the Bible tells us that there were some women who actually traveled with Jesus and the disciples as they ministered from village to village. Uh, uh, there were a lot of women who were drawn to Jesus's ministry, but there was a group of women who traveled with and participated in Jesus's ministry. In fact, Luke chapter 8 gives us this description. Luke chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 3, uh, soon afterwards, Jesus began a tour of the nearby towns and villages, preaching and announcing the good news about the kingdom of God. He took his 12 disciples with him, along with some women he had healed and from whom he had cast out evil spirits. Among them were Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, 
Herod's business manager, Susanna, and many others who were contributing their own resources to help support to support Jesus and his disciples. So there was this group of women who traveled with them, and these women were literally in, investing in this ministry. I mean, literally. Uh, and Luke is telling us that the, these these women were contributing financially to the ministry. And, and had it been allowed in the first century, these women would have been called disciples. Um, but no rabbi in this time frame would have had women who were called disciples, but these women certainly fit that description uh, of being disciples as they traveled with and ministered and supported the ministry. And in case of Mary Magdalene, we actually don't know much about her. We know more about her than the other women, uh, but Mary Magdalene, we can survive. It, it's possible that uh, she didn't know her earthly father. It, it's possible that he died when she was young. Uh, we can also surmise that that not only was her dad not alive, uh, we can surmise that she was married and didn't have it. She wasn't married and didn't have any children. So um, her dad's not alive. Uh, she's not married and she doesn't have children. Now, how do we know that? Well, the, the reason that we think that these things are true is that in the first century, it was a very patriarchal society, and a woman was known, a woman was always known in a relationship to a man or their children. And there were a lot of Marys or, or Mariams in that time. And if you were not married, you would be known as Mary, the daughter of whomever. If you weren't married, you would be known as by your father's name, Mary, the daughter of whoever. But Mary Magdalene is never described as Mary, the daughter of anybody. If you were married, you would be known as Mary, the wife of. But she is never described as Mary, the wife of anybody. If you would have been married and your husband died or you were divorced and you had children, you would be known as Mary, the mother of. And she's never described that way either. Um, you, you see that with Jesus's mother, that sometimes she's described as Mary, the mother of Jesus. But we don't find that in Mary Magdalene. She, she's never described as the daughter of, the wife of, or the mother of. She's none of those things. She's simply described as Mary Magdalene. And the word Magdalene actually comes from the name of a fishing village on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee called Magdala, uh, which in the time of Christ was a, a very thriving populated town about three miles from Capernaum. And so her name is just Mary from Magdala. Now, Magdala was known for uh, its main output was, was dyed works and textile factories. Uh, and, and so it was a very wealthy community, um, a very successful community. Uh, so this may be where Mary acquired the money. Uh, with which she is able to support Jesus. We, we don't know for sure, uh, but maybe one of the reasons that Mary didn't get married or have a family it could have been the fact that Luke tells us that Jesus had freed her from seven demons. And when she encountered Jesus, he cast out those demons. Now, I don't know what Mary's life looked like before she was freed. There have been a lot of articles written and a lot of speculation, but whatever her life was like, it wasn't good. She was in bondage. She was not living. She was just existing. And whatever her life looked like, for one thing we know with absolute certainty is that Jesus set her free. And because of her encounter with Jesus, she was free to become the person that God had created her to be. And I think Easter means some certain things for us. And, and I think that's the first thing that Easter means, is that Easter means that Jesus freed you up to be who you were meant to be. One of the, the greatest points that would be easy to miss in the story is that Mary is not who she used to be. And because of her encounter with Jesus, she's completely changed. And that's the great truth of Easter, isn't it? The great truth of Easter is, is that we don't have to be the same. We can change. And you've heard me say this at Crossroads a lot. You, you you would, on a Sunday morning, I would say something to the effect of, hey, look at all the people sitting around you. And, and in fact, if you, you look at the list of people who are on here tonight, um, you know you know them as, as really nice church people, don't you? But the fact is, if you do some of the stories, 
you'd, you'd be a little bit of afraid. But the good news is we didn't stay that way. We didn't stay that way. Jesus changed us. And the Bible says that Mary had seven demons. And, and, and we sometimes use a term to refer to people who are struggling. And, and we'll use a term where we say, well, you know, they're just, they're just kind of fighting their demons. And, 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 and that's kind of a lot of people are like that today. A lot of people, you know, are struggling with stuff. And, 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 and when they're alone, I, you know, I don't know what runs through their heads. And, and I don't know the weaknesses that we fight on a daily basis. But, but I know a God who changes people. I know a God who sets people free. I know a God who liberates. I know a God who heals minds and heals spirit. I know a God who takes alcoholics and makes them sober. I know a God who takes addicts and makes them clean. I know a God who takes people with all sordid pasts and make them holy. That's what Easter is about, isn't it? That God takes sinners and makes them saints. And, and we had played the video several times at, at Crossroads of, of S.M. Lockridge in, in that great uh, uh, sermon that he did, you know, where he says, that's my king. And, and, and you remember in that, that's my king, one of the things he kept saying is, do you know him? Do you know him? That's my king. And that's what Easter's about is that when we come to know God, he changes us. And I love what John says in John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is a part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. That's good news, isn't it? That's what Easter is all about. And that's what happened to Mary. She's changed. She's set free. And now she's involved, and now she's an eyewitness to the most important event that this world has ever seen. And that wouldn't have happened if she had not been changed. And, and, and here's something that I believe with all my heart, that I believe you can never reach your full potential until you surrender your life to God. I believe that with all my heart that you can never reach your full potential until you surrender your life with God. And I believe that God made all of us with a purpose in mind. God says, I know the plans I have for you. God says, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you. And God says, I, I, I've got special plans for you. I've got people who need touching. I, I've got kids that need a friend. I've got neighborhoods that need change. And, and, and he says, I want to make you the best possible version of you. One of the interesting things about Mary Magdalene is, is all the stuff that has been attributed to her that is not true. Uh, for instance, it was widely circulate, circulated that she was a prostitute. Well, the Bible never says that. Uh, that's because uh, in the 6th century, Pope Gregory, in a sermon that he preached about Mary Magdalene being a model penitent, merged her identity with the, the sinner who anoints the Jesus' feet in Luke chapter 7. And although we know from other Gospels that it wasn't her, she wasn't the woman who did that. Um, and then all the novelists and screenwriters always try to insert something salacious into the life of Jesus. And when they try to do that, they focus on one woman, Mary from Magdala. Uh, she's been in movies as a prostitute. Uh, there are some people who love to tout a text that was found in the 5th century called the Gospel of Mary, but the, the problem with it is it's not Bible or Gospel. Um, and then this Gospel of Mary, we don't even know uh, what Mary is being referred to in this book. And, and this book was written actually hundreds of years after Jesus died. Um, and, and it's interesting enough, it, there, this book is a book of nine chapters. There are six that are missing, and the two that we do have are only partially there. So if you ever hear anyone quote to you and try to make some kind of point from the Gospel of Mary's, don't believe anything that somebody might try to tell you out of this lost gospel. Um and there have been so many people, Dan Brown, William Phipps, uh, Martin Solskazy, all of them have tried to portray Mary Magdalene as the lover or the wife of Jesus. And, and there is no evidence either in the Bible or any other reliable text outside the Bible. 
and I, I read this quote. I, I thought this was great. They said this whole idea is kind of like uh, heartburn after eating at a cheap Mexican restaurant. It just keeps coming up. And one of the things, I one of the problems is our culture has gotten to the point that our culture can't understand love and can't imagine it without a sexual component. Uh, there are people that can't grasp the relationship between Jesus and the Apostle John uh, because the Bible talks about that John is the one that Jesus loved. Um, you know, and so they can't imagine that. And, and that brings up kind of another thing about Easter. Because Easter, Jesus frees you up who you were meant to be. And, and then the second, I think Easter means you can know love. Now, I didn't say that you could be in love. I said that you could know love. And the fact is, God doesn't just love us. God is love. God is love. But how do we define it? Now, the Heritage American, the, the American Heritage Dictionary defines love as an intense affection for another person based on a familiar or personal ties. Uh, an, an intense affection for another person based on familiar or personal ties. So we love other people, or when we say that we love other people, that, that we are attracted to them and they make us feel good. But the key phrase in the dictionary, it, it says that it's based on. And that phrase implies that we love conditionally. In other words, we love someone because they fulfill a condition that we require before we can love them. So our love is not only conditional, it's also subject to sudden or unpredictable changes. We love based on feelings or emotions that change from one moment to the next. So it's almost impossible for us to comprehend a love that is unconditional. And I don't think that even those of us who have been around church for a long, long time completely understand God's love. It's totally without conditions. And I want, I want you to look at a very familiar verse. And, and I want you to listen to this verse like you were hearing it for the very first time. This is Romans chapter 5, verse 8. And, and I'm going to do it in the message translation. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and this is the message translation. Listen to this like you're hearing it for the very first time. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were, while we were of no use to him whatsoever. Now let me say that again. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use whatever to him. And I think you see in that verse what I mean in the difference of God. It's the difference of God being in love with us and the fact that God is love. See, God's not just in love with us. God is love. God's love is completely without conditions. And that's so hard for us to grasp. But I think that's one of the, the, the truths of Easter. You don't need another person to fulfill you because that person won't. And even those of us who have been married for a long, long time know that our spouses are not going to meet every need. Only God can do that. And, and you know, it, it's a fact that people may not be able to reach you when you feel alone or isolated. And when you feel like no one notices you. But God is there. God's love. And, and when you look at your life and, and, and things seem being like there seems like they're just such a mess and there's no way out, God's there. And when your past haunts you and, and, and all of us have a past and, and we're all embarrassed by the things that we've done, and, and when you're embarrassed, God's there. He's love. And, and when you would never want anyone to know the things that you've done in those private moments and you would be mortified if others knew, God's there. God's love. And you can know love because God's love is not conditional. God's love is not based on what you can do for him. God's love is not based on how you act. God's love is not based on, God is love. It's completely unconditional. So Easter, really, I mean, we see that whole thing that Jesus frees us up to be 
who we're meant to be. And, and, and because of Easter, you can know love. And I think also because of Easter, this is one of the huge things. Because of Easter, we can know God personally. One of the things that a few years ago, it's been many years ago now, but I was reading the Easter story. And one of the things that just leaped out of me is one little word in the Easter story that we read there tonight. One little word. And you know what the one word is? The one word is Mary. Look at Mary's encounter with Jesus in the garden. And this is John chapter 20. If you've still got it there, uh, turn to verse 15. John chapter 20, verse 15. And there's one little word here that it just jumps out. It says this, dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? So Mary has come to the garden alone, and, and she sees this gardener who she thinks is a gardener, and, and she's crying, and, and this gardener walks up to her and says, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she thought it was the gardener. The scripture goes on. She thought it was, he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you put him, and I'll go get him. Mary, Jesus said. And she turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. This is so key. Now, Jesus, Mary didn't recognize Jesus at first because her grief had blinded her. And you may have, you know, you may think, well, why didn't she recognize him? Well, I want you to think about this. She couldn't see him because she didn't expect to see him. He was dead. And she couldn't put what her eyes were telling her into context. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had that happen? I just, this last summer had this happen. There was there was a pastor friend of mine who uh, was retired, lives in Oklahoma, and I was working security at, a, at, at the racetrack that's here local, and, and I was standing guard over this gate that people were coming in, and this pastor friend of mine walked in, and I said to him, hey, how are you doing, and, and called him by name, and he looked at me. I, for several seconds, and we've known each other for years, and he looked at me, and he, and he finally said, Dan, right? And it's like, why wouldn't he recognize me? Well, I was completely out of context. He, he, he's come up from Oklahoma to watch a friend of his race and, and had no idea that, that I didn't still live in South Dakota and he's in Missouri and he sees me, it's out of con and he didn't recognize me. He stared straight at me and was like, finally recognize me. And, and it's one of those things that, that we can give Mary a lot of grief, but that's what's happening here. She thought Jesus was dead and she sees him and she can't put into context what her eyes are telling her. And when Jesus spoke her name, she immediately recognizes him. Imagine that moment. Imagine Jesus calling your name. Because that's what the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ is all about. The Bible tells us, that at the moment of Jesus' death, the curtain that separated the holy place, the area in the temple where the priests ministered, the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place, or the holy of holies, where God was and only the high priest could go, that curtain that separated those two rooms when Jesus died ripped in half. Now, this is going back quite a few years ago. But I remember when the Dodge Viper first came out. It was 1992, in fact. The Dodge Viper first came out. I was living in Gillette, Wyoming at the time. And, and the man who owned the Dodge dealership went to our church. And 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 uh, now you, you have to little give me a little context on the Dodge Viper. The Dodge Viper was like this super sports car. Um, in 1992, the Dodge Viper was listed at $55,630, which was unheard of for a car in 1992. 
Now, that first year in 1992, Dodge only made 285 of those cars. And then the next year in 1993, they only made 1,043 of those cars. These cars were so rare that dealers couldn't even get them. And, and it was sometime in 1993 that our local dealer got one, just one. And because there were so few of them, even though the list price was 55000 these cars were selling for well over $100,000. So when a dealer got one, they wanted to take extra special care of, of this valuable investment. So uh, the pastors of our church uh, had been at a staff meeting, and, and we were gone out to eat after the staff meeting together. And, and we were on our way back to the church. And as we were driving along, a uh, senior pastor, who was Isaac Smith, said, hey, any of you guys seen the Viper yet? And all of us said, no, none of us had seen it. And and so we stopped into the Dodge dealership to get our first look at this new muscle car. And the showroom had every other car removed. The only car in the showroom was this Viper. And it sat in the middle of the showroom, all gleaming red and, and had a fence around it. So nobody could get close to it and possibly damage it. And there were people standing around the fence looking, and, and we went in, we did the same thing. We we stood outside the fence, and we were admiring this mechanical marvel. When the owner of the dealership walked in, the guy that went to our church, and he walked into the showroom as we were standing there looking at this, and he said, hey, pastors, do you want to see my new toy? And he walked over, and he opened up the fence and he motioned us to come in. And while all the other people stood outside the fence, we walked in and we opened up the hood and we looked at that big V12 motor and we touched it and we walked around it and we sat in it. It's a huge difference when somebody calls your name and says, come on in, he's with me. And on Easter, that curtain tore. And the Bible says that Jesus became our high priest. And that curtain, when he died, ripped from top to bottom. And he allows us now to come into the most holy place because he's our high priest. And Jesus turns and he calls out your name. And he says, come on in. You're with me. Just like Jesus calling out Mary's name, Jesus is still calling out names today. And Jesus is saying, your name. And he's saying, come on in. You're with me. In fact, Jesus says it this way in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. He said, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, open the door and I'll come in. And we'll share a meal together as friends. And that's the good news, isn't it? That's the good news that Jesus calls our name. And I have always been struck by all the things that Jesus could have said post-resurrection. And what did he choose to say? He chose to say, Mary. Because he calls us by name. He knows us personally. So the fact is, Jesus frees us up to be who we were meant to be. And the fact is, we can know love because his love is completely unconditional. And the fact is, we have a God who knows us. He knows where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows you personally. And the better part is, you can know God personally. And God said, I call you friend. And God still calls us by name. That's good news, isn't it? That's such good news. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. That's great news, isn't it? That is great news. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Thank you, God, 
that you help us to become the person that we were intended to be. When we surrender our lives to you, that's when we reach our full potential. And thank you, God, that you love us unconditionally, that even when we were of no use to you, you still loved us and you sent Jesus to die for us. And thank you, God, that you still call us by name and we can know you personally. And you say, come on into the presence of God because he's or she was with me. Thank you, God, that we can know that. And Easter makes all the difference. And so, God, we just rejoice in the truth of this season. We rejoice in the fact that you died on the cross for us. You came back to life on the third day. And now you sit at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. And one day you are coming back to take us home. Thank you for that truth, God. And thank you for the truth of Easter. And I pray that tomorrow that you will help us to live like the tomb is empty and help us to live like people who know the tomb is empty. And thank you for your love. Go with us now, God, and keep us in your care. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And we'll be back right here again on Wednesday night at uh, 7 o'clock Mountains and 8 o'clock Central. And love to have you come back and join us next week as we got just a few weeks left in this season. And so we'd love to have you come back. Make sure you're in service on Sunday and uh, make sure that uh, you are worshiping with your, with your family on Sunday, whether in person or online. Make sure you're going to be there. Well, it's so great to have you here tonight. Thank you for joining us. It, it just means a lot to me that you would just take the time to come out and uh, just enjoy this time together. So thank you for being here. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week.